Hello. I am Dr. Carl Middleton, the interim senior vice president for the Texas division. And it's my pleasure to be with you today. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the ethical and religious directives. And you're, you're now seeing a, a picture of these directives, in this little white booklet. And if you would like a copy of these, please see your local mission leader and they, they will have copies for you. In terms of the objectives of, of my presentation this afternoon, and by the way, this is my 45th year as, as a theologian and ethicist in Catholic healthcare, uh, so I pretty much live with the ethical news directors for a long time. The objectives are to give you some background and some history, to provide an overview of the, of the ethical news directives, and, and by the way, the acronym that you'll hear is ERDs, that we would like for you somewhat familiar with the chapter contents, and then what are the resources available to you should you have some questions. A few years back, I saw a Charles Schultz Peanuts cartoon strip in the Sunday paper. And it was Lucy looking out the window and Charlie Brown watching television. And Lucy is saying, Charlie Brown, isn't life like a diamond necklace? Charlie Brown continues to watch the television. He doesn't respond at all. Well, this perturbs her. She says, Charlie Brown, isn't life like a diamond necklace? Again, he doesn't respond. So in the next frame, there is Lucy with her hands around Charlie Brown's throat, throttling him, saying, Charlie Brown, isn't life like a diamond necklace? And he responds, it is sort of like a choker. <laughs> well, some of you may have heard about the ethical and religious directives, and some of you may have heard some people thinking they're a diamond necklace. But on the other hand, some people may say, given some of those directives, they're like a choker. The first thing I want to just say, there's 72 directives and 69 are basically on what it means to provide holistic, quality health care. So I want you to keep that in mind. Also, I'd like to unpack for you that the directives trying to get at what is the meaning of Catholic identity from the American bishop's point of view. And those are beliefs, behaviors, and bondholders. And you say, well, what's a bondholder? Well, it's a stakeholder. And then some people have said, well, why didn't you say that? Because I think three Bs are cooler than two Bs and an S. So in terms of beliefs of Catholic identity, what we mean when we talk about that, all persons are created in God's image. We are unique. We are precious. Caring for the sick is an official ministry of the Catholic Church. That the care should be holistic, and that's mind, body, spirit care. And health care is for the common good. What, what that means, common good is, is not a cliche phrase. It's a theological term. And what it means is for the common good, if you're, if you're working for the common good, you are providing the basic needs that a person has so as to fulfill their purpose and meaning of life. And the church has identified six basic needs, food, clothing, shelter, education, work, and health care, and health care. So for the church, it perceives that as, as a basic human right that people need. Um, so I want just to say that, and because that's, that's critically important that we understand when you see that term common good, you're talking about fulfilling the goals and purpose of a, of a human person's life. And to do that, they need, you need to meet the basic needs. And that's why we, you and I are involved in something tremendously important and tremendously sacred. We are helping fulfill one of the basic needs that every human person has. That's the need for health care. Now we're challenged today 
is to say how do we make that more affordable and, and, and accessible and how do we do, do that in such a way that, that we live our values and, and we reverence the human dignity of each person. The second thing is behaviors, that we're to adhere to an ethical code, which are the ERDs, that we provide compassion and healing, we address society's systematic ills, and that's why CHI has placed a tremendous, tremendous emphasis on violence prevention, and particularly here, one of the ways that we get at violence prevention is the outstanding work that's being done in, in, in raising awareness and educating and caring for the victims of human trafficking. That we also create a just workplace. And, and we, that, by that means that Catholic social teachings would emphasize that employees have a say in the major decisions. And we are committed to excellent care. The third is that of being a stakeholder, a bondholder, and those include professionals, employees, volunteers, executive leadership, governance, and, and even the local bishops. So a little bit of the history. Of, well, first of all, what are the ethical religious directives? The ERDs are a code of ethics. A code is a statement of values, is an assertion of goals, an expression of rules, and enables good decision making. So in the next, next slide is a, is a triangle. And if you were looking into moral textbooks or ethics textbooks, there would be listed, this triangle, you would find it under levels of moral reasoning. At, at the pinnacle at the top is value or principle. So we say, if I said, how many of you believe in, in the sanctity of life? the sanctity of human life, probably everybody would raise their hands. But now what happens in society is say, well, we believe in the sanctity of human life. Then you move to the next level, you develop rules by which then you protect that basic value or principle. So no direct abortion, no physician assisted suicide. Now we know those things are debated, not everybody feels that way, but that's how it does. If you have a value, then you create rules to protect it. And the last thing is you then apply those rules to a specific situation or case in our in instance. And so uh, there's not a day that goes by that I don't use this pyramid. When people call in with the case, I then say, okay, what are the rules? What are the values that, that are pertinent to this case? If somebody talks to the values, they would say, okay, what are the rules that would help protect and nurture and foster and sustain these, these values. So you can see why that is very important. Uh, this triangle is very important uh, in terms of that. And what happens is a lot of times um, we focus on just the case or the rules. Let, let me give you an example of the fourth commandment. There's two versions of the fourth commandment, which is the fourth of the 10, the Decalogue. And, and the, the one version is the book of Deuteronomy that says, honor your father and mother. That's the one most of us were taught. But there is an earlier version. And that one says, honor your father and mother so that you too shall live to see long days. Now that's interesting. So I began to say, I wouldn't want to study about that one. Because my parents used the fourth commandment as a club over my head to get me to take out the garbage and to make my bed and keep my room clean and, and all that kinds of stuff. And those are important things. And, and, and so they would always threaten me with honor your father and mother because God told you so. Well, the, the origination of that commandment occurred when they, the Hebrew people were nomads wandering in the desert, moving from their sheep from watering hole to watering hole. And what happened is some of the elder became enfeebled and they left them in the desert to die. So, the commandment says, you middle-aged adults, if you want to live to see long life, then you better honor your father and mother's life because your kids are going to know what to do with you when you can't keep up with the wagon train. 
So that's why I honor your father and mother so that you two should live to see long days. It has nothing to do with taking out garbage or making your bed. But it does have everything to say about what family and intergenerations intergenera and respect and dignity for all avenues and all ages and of all stages of development of human life. So that's how, we, what, what my point is here, if you separate the value from the rule, which that's what has happened. It separated the history, it separated the purpose, and it, and it got to honor your father and mother, and then it began to, to be applied to things. It, it, that commandment is more like saying, don't put your parents in a nursing home and forget them. Go visit them regularly. Or don't put them in a long-term care facility. Or because your grandfather has Alzheimer's and he can't remember you, that doesn't mean you abandon him. You keep trying. So that's, it's, it's, that's an important dimension here. And sometimes in church documents, which is, it has occurred in its Catholic documents, the Catholic teaching, we separate the value from the rules. And that's why I tell all in, in healthcare leadership, if you're going to write a policy, make sure the policy, that policy ought to foster, nurture, and sustain a basic value. And so you need to identify that value in the policy rationale. So, or it won't make any sense to people if you don't point that out. So the next thing was about the background and history is the ERDs are just what I call a piece of the church's teaching pie. So the Pope teaches, Cardinals teaches, like Cardinal DiNardo, the, the Archbishop of the Galveston Houston Archdiocese, and you know, they're, they have many avenues and ways to teach. In 1940 was the first national code that was, the, if you will, the semblance of being to look like the ethical directives. There was another version in the 50s, another version in 71, and another version in 94. The one we have here was developed in 1994. There's been a few changes. Uh, and one of the changes in 94 was they consulted all kinds of hospital administrators, physicians, nurses, et cetera. And they then changed the title from ethical religious directors for Catholic hospitals to, to, from Catholic facilities to Catholic services which is showing the, the change in the signs of the times. And um, in the background in history, there was changes in 2001, part six was revived. And November 17, 2009, there was a, a revision to Directive 58, and I'll reference that. And, and so you can see, they, they're, they're not changed very often. And I often get the question, uh, Carl, why, why don't the directives deal with the, the morality of embryonic stem cell research? Very good reason. This was published in 94. Embryonic stem cells were not discovered until 1997. So that means we have to use our own uh, common good sense uh, to then um, apply uh, some of these rules and some of these teachings to or continuing developmental issues that are raised by increasing and improving technologies. In the next slide, I listed three types of ethics that we're responsible for. Most often in healthcare, we're, we tend to be focused to bioethics or clinical ethics issues. It's gone by different names. 50, let me say 30, 35 years ago, it was called medical ethics. Then it was changed to bioethics in the, in the late 70s and 80s, and then in the 90s and the 2000s, it's clinical ethics. But there's organizational ethics, and that's the focus on organization systems, structures, and processes that shape the encounter between patients and healthcare providers, which is clinical ethics. And then social ethics, it focuses on the external system structures, and processes that shape the encounter between patients and healthcare providers. So such thing as violence prevention and, and issues of working uh, for the victims of human trafficking, 
those who I would put in the category of a combination of organizational and social ethics. They could involve clinical ethics where the person has been harmed and needs medical care and treatment. In the first section of the ethical religious directives, there is the preamble. And, and first of all, that the bishops, all 370 some out of, of them, vote on these kind of documents. And it's up to, while they voted and approved them, it's up to each individual bishop to, to uh, promulgate them and interpret them. And as I get a lot of complaints sometimes from doctors, so why is it when I was in this diocese, the bishop allowed it, and when I'm in this diocese, the bishop said no. That's the bishop's prerogative to be able to promulgate and interpret those directives for his diocese. So the preamble, why are we writing this? The bishops say back in 94, we're writing this because of technological advances challenged by social factors, decreasing number of religious, and the increasing role of laity, many of whom are other than Catholic. And so therefore we want to make sure that they know who, what the Catholic Church teaches since they're responsible for upholding the Catholic Church teachings in a Catholic hospital. So the purpose of the ethical religious directives is to reaffirm and reaffirm ethical standards and provide authoritative guidance on some moral matters. And you notice the carefulness there, not all moral matters, doesn't deal with everything, just as I've mentioned in embryonic stem cell research. Uh, that doesn't make it right because they didn't deal with it. It just hadn't happened when they, when they wrote this document. Who's the document written for? Sponsors, trustees, executive leaders, chaplains, physicians, healthcare personnel. And the structure, there's a, there's a structure to the, this little booklet. It's got a general introduction. It has six chapters. And the chapters are based on the triangle. Values, directives of rules, and then application to certain situations in certain circumstances. And then it gives a general introduction. And in the general introduction, it says that we're basically... This is an official ministry of the church. We're carrying on what Jesus started 2,000 years ago. We're about the healing of whole persons, mind, body, spirit healing, and that, that dovetails in with, with CHI's focus of person-centered care, assessing and responding mind, body, spirit needs. And that, that this is an official ministry of the church, as I've stated. We have, we have pontifical juridic status in the church. That's the, instead of using the term civil, it's, it's uh, according to the church's teachings and law. And then we're about then helping more fully understanding the meaning of suffering and, and death in our lives. Uh, the, let me just give you a brief overview of each of the six parts. Um, the part one is social responsibility. Part two is pastoral and spiritual responsibilities. Three, professional patient relationships. Four, beginning of life, five, end of life issues, and then six, forming new partnerships. Now, um, it is important to understand that uh, the anatomy of the ethical and religious directors are based on the Catholic social teaching. And those principles are life and dignity of the human person, a call to family, community, and participation, rights and responsibilities of human individuals, option for the poor and the vulnerable, the dignity of work and the rights of workers, solidarity, means we're, everyone is my brother and my sister, and then the care for God's creation, as emphasized, being emphasized these days by Pope Francis. So part one is the social responsibility of Catholic health care services. The general principles or the values listed here are, are interesting. Promote human dignity. The first four directives of part one is on our responsibility to, to provide health care and to make health care as affordable and accessible as possible and to care for those who are poor and vulnerable. That one of the ways that we achieve this is through stewarding available resources. Uh, and, and remember that the term stewardship is a biblical term, which basically means that you're using the resources to fulfill the mission. 
Uh, not just financial resources, because usually it often used as stewardship was like, how are you taking care of the finances? This can be human resources, time resources, um, financial resources, and then as Pope Francis has emphasized, the care of the environment and the healing of that environment. And then we refuse to permit morally wrong procedures. So what are the implications of part one for those of us in the healthcare ministry and particularly for persons in clinical care? That we strive to make healthcare affordable and accessible. We, we strive to continue the legacy of the sisters of not turning the poor away because they can't pay. And then we steward, steward, uh, steward available resources. In part two, it's on the pastoral and spiritual responsibility of Catholic health care. And the, 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 the framework there is the values, human dignity, holistic care, Catholic health ministry, collaboration, and how those, those values express treating the sick and the dying and the needy, helping heal mind, body, and spirit, uh, providing spiritual care as one of our hallmarks of Catholic health care and network and realizing that we can't provide spiritual care to everybody uh, in, in the Houston area. So it means that we have to network with local churches. We have to, we have to provide uh, collabor collaborative experiences and partnerships with, with the local churches. We're talking about all churches, not just Catholic churches, to help them further meet the needs of the spiritual care needs of our people. I find that the, that the bishop's definition of spiritual care is broad, but it's good. And that is, spiritual care is a listening presence, help with powerlessness and pain, and assistance in responding to God's will. Now, I'm sure that, you know, I started out my career as being the director of a pastoral care department and as a chaplain. And, and there were days that I thought some of the folks in housekeeping did a better job of being a chaplain than, than I did because of their ability to just focus and center and listen to that person and then, and then to listen and then show care and then to provide care and some kind of affirmation. And, and so that's, now that's not to take away the role of the professional, uh, professionally trained chaplain but that also says, I firmly believe in a Catholic hospital, all of us are called to show up, to listen, and to provide care and affirmation. And not just the, spiritual, the professional spiritual caregivers. All of us are called to do that. What are the implications for us? Appreciate spiritual care as integral to healing. Appreciate your work as a physician or nurse or tech, an LPN as an expression of your spirituality. And, to, uh, and the challenge is how are we going to provide spiritual care to thousands of covered lives that we can now call population health? And where the whole focus is to keep people out of the hospital, not in the hospital. So that, that's a challenge for us, uh, for those of us in mission and spiritual care. So in part three, the professional patient relationship. The responsibilities of the healthcare professional is to pursue goals of healing, to provide maintenance of health, and this is most important, compassionate care of the dying. The patient responsibilities is to use physical and mental and, and healthcare resources to achieve moral and spiritual goals and to be good stewards of those healthcare resources. What are the implications of part three? Um, uh, well, in part three, it, it basically talks about, well, I'll point that out. It's a sacred relationship that between the provider and patient is a sacred relationship. That it fully, we fully respect the dignity of the human person. We respect patients' need for privacy and confidentiality. We encourage advanced directives. These are all the things that the bishops speak about in this chapter that we, we are called to be persons of integrity and truth-telling, and that the availability of an ethics committee is there to help us resolve clinical and ethical issues. And, and they also call for care and understanding and particularly uh, uh, appropriate uh, care 
uh, of victims of rape. Um, in, in part number four, uh, beginning of life issues, the ethical framework of here is human dignity again, the sanctity of life, respect for marriage, conjugal love, and family life occurring in the context of those relationships, and then the appropriate use of technologies. The highlights of the directives, which are 38 to 54, is that uh, prenatal services are encouraged, that direct abortion is, is considered immoral, that's Directive 45. Um, and, and the term direct and indirect, in case you're reading this booklet, is not referring to the procedure itself. It's referring to your intention to have the procedure. So for example, to say, I've had three kids and I, whoop, I'm, I'm, I'm pregnant now with the fourth one, and I don't want to have the fourth one, so I'll have an abortion. We would consider that a direct abortion. That's not, not to be confused with what we sometimes call indirect, and that is a woman that is, let's say, 18 weeks gestation and uh, her uterus ruptures, or a massive bleeding in her, in, her, in her uterus, and we have to then save the life of the mother. And uh, Directive 47 says that we may then have to induce uh, labor, uh, induction of labor pre-viability in order to save the life of the mother. So that's not to be confused with that. We have, the church is committed to some of the movies have not done us justice in being able to point out the fact that we do have a way of saving the life of the mother. Uh, in vitro fertilization, again, that's life in a petri dish and that's you're separating uh, the, the institution of marriage and, and, and for the conjugal act. Prenatal diagnosis is permissible with the right intention. Non-therapeutic experiments are problematic, meaning non-therapeutic exper experiments on the human people. Uh, that's research and experiments are done if they have a medical purpose or treatment, that is put it in a positive fashion. Um, contraception is that, that the, the directive on contraception is written for the hospitals. The hospitals can't condone that, and then direct sterilization is permitted when there's a current and present pathology, and genetic counseling is permitted. Implications for caregivers. How these are interpreted could change from diocese to diocese. You need to be familiar with what is permissible and, and not in your diocese. And let me just say that if there's any concern about that, contact your mission leader. Your mission leader should know about that or at least point you in the right direction. The church emphasizes the sanctity of human life. And if there are questions or issues, uh, contact appropriate personnel, uh, including your, your, your chaplains and your mission leaders. Part five, issues in care of the dying. Uh, the focus here is, um, is on the transcendent meaning of life, stewardship of human life, proportionate means, disproportionate means, withholding, withdrawing, artificial nutrition, hydration. What we say here is that there is a criteria to be used in decision making to whether that, that I, should I uh, undergo this technology, ventilators and these kind of things, or can I forego those and, and be morally appropriate. The first thing you need in making that any kind of decision is the clinical diagnosis and prognosis. The second thing is you need is the patient's informed judgment where competent. If not competent, then it's the surrogate. But let me clarify something here. I, I, being an ethicist and being at the, in the ICU and the CCUs and standing at the bedsides and refereeing siblings who are fighting over mom and dad, uh, that let me clarify the role of a surrogate. The role of a surrogate is, is not to pretend that God died and left you in charge. The role of a surrogate is, is, is to really to say, if mom was standing here or if mom was competent in this bed, what would mom tell us to do? So it's not me deciding what's best for mom. It's me trying to get in touch with mom's value system and to say, if mom was competent and to make this decision, what would mom choose? 
And that's what we, we have to work to get toward, those of us who are siblings and those, uh, those uh, of us who are children to, to aging elderly parents. So that's, that's a key thing. The highlights of directors, no euthanasia, obviously physician assisted suicide or nurse assisted suicide. I've had cases where nurses call me up and say, a patient has told me that they would want me just to use a pillow to smother them and, uh, or, to, or they were gonna smother themselves and would I just walk on by and leave them alone and stuff. So the nurses are sometimes asked to do that as well. Compassionate pain management. This is, it's a moral obligation to enable people to, to be able to tolerate and deal with their pain. And so that's why we should excel in all of our institutions at pain management. A withholding of nutrition and fluids. Um, well, first of all, withholding of any type of technologies. Uh, uh, Directive 56 is proportionate means. In other words, there's hope of benefit. And it's the patient that gets determined who's of hope of benefit what's of hope and benefit, whether that's emotional or spiritual or financial, it's up to the patient to determine that. And disproportionate means is where there is no hope or benefit. And what you do, you have to weigh the benefits and the burdens. If the benefits outweigh the burdens, then you're morally bound to do it. If the burdens outweigh the benefits, it's Directive 57 says it's disproportionate and you get to decide. And, and withholding of nutrition and fluids are, are made that same way, especially if you're in the dying process, you outweigh artificial administered nutrition and hydration from a benefit and burden perspective. Determination of death, you use legitimate scientific means to do that. Organ transplantation, that, that's considered a good, uh, except that they, they, they're not high on you giving your heart away if you need it. And so, uh, it usually refers to if you got two or something, that's, that's appropriate for you to say give up one last we saw on the news the other night. And then obviously the use of infant tissue and organs from aborted fetuses and stuff would, would be, that's, not, that's most problematic. So what's the implications for caregivers? Obviously euthanasia is not morally permissible, nor is it legally permissible in a number of states. And, the, and I think there's five states now that do, that have made it legally permissible. Our focus is on compassionate pain and symptom management. Take specific concerns to MBO mission leaders or the MBO ethics committee regarding your withholding, withdrawing cases and those kind of things. And this one, I hope people listen to me well. You're not morally bound to prolong life at all costs. Or I like to say, you're not morally bound to squeeze every ounce of life out of somebody before you allow them to die. And, and that is contained in these directives. Part six is on partnerships. Well, partnerships can be good news. The witnesses, church of teaching, responsible for stewardship, realigning delivery systems, avoiding duplication, providing equitable access for people. That can be good news if that's what the partnerships uh, achieve. But they can be bad news if they threaten Catholic identity, if, if they cause scandal due to involvement in illicit or activities that the church considers immoral. And, and, and by the way, the, the definition of scandal is not upsetting somebody. The definition of scandal is leading another person into sin. So that's a very precision canonical definition of scandal for, for, for the church. The highlights 67 to 70, basically it was required, if you're going through some kind of uh, planning for a partnership, <clears throat> consultation uh, is mandatory with the, with the bishops, and in our instance, Cardinal DiNardo. So when we wanted to acquire St. Luke's Episcopal Hospitals and some of these other houses, Brazos Board and the, those, uh, the memorial, we had to have permission of the local bishops. Now, Cardinal Donardo is for the Galveston Houston Archdiocese. Uh, there's, there's the Bishop uh, of Tyler, Texas for Memorial in Lufkin. The Livingston is, is, the, is in the Beaumont Diocese. And, and so 
uh, and given St. Joseph and Brian, we're in the Austin Diocese. So we're in four dioceses, if you will. And so depending on those institutions and their partnerships, they would need to then work with their local bishop. So partnerships would pose serious consequences to a Catholic identity or entail high risk of scandal, um, basically uh, need to have the bishop's approval. Partnerships which affect the mission or Catholic provider and institutions subject to governing authority need to have the approval of the bishop. So that's a, that's a bird's eye view, 50,000 foot view of the ethical and religious directives. Uh, what we hopefully can do for the many people would have needs or like to do further uh, studies of some uh, applications of some of these chapters. We're willing to come out, uh, Deacon David Jarvis and myself to come out and, and to, uh, to help you all apply it more specifically to, to beginning of life and end of life issues. Uh, my conclusions of this presentation that ERDs will require ongoing interpretation. New developments in medical technology, clinical situations and circumstances vary, growth and understanding of our faith, and then the legal structures oftentimes determine how the ethical and religious directors are applied. Are the ERDs a diamond necklace or are they a choker? I would hope I've helped you see that in, in my opinion, they are a diamond necklace and, and really help us uh, th through the, the murky waters that we call modern day healthcare, who is going, undergoing serious transformation as we speak. But I, I, wanna, I wanna end with a story, which, which is my style. There's a rabbi sitting on a park bench and two teenage boys were coming home from school and they, they saw a bird that was unable to fly. So they picked the bird up and, and they said, let's play a trick on the rabbi. So they come up to the rabbi and they say, Rabbi, we have a bird behind our back. Can you tell us, is this bird dead or is it alive? Well, the rabbi looks at him and, and you know, it doesn't take him long to figure out that he says that if, if the bird was dead, he, they would present it to him alive and laugh at him. That's not what bothered them. What really bothered them is, is the potential for him saying the bird is alive and they would crush it and kill it and present it to him dead. So he looks them straight in the eye and says the life and death of that bird is in your hands. And what I've tried to say today through these ethical and religious directors, the ethical and the moral life of our institutions is like the rabbi said, it's in your and my hands. Thank you.